Welcome to the MSME Radio Network. The broadcast shows are for informational and entertainment purposes only. They are not designed to provide listeners with specific personal, medical, or counseling advice. Individuals with a medical issue should always consult their health care provider. MSME is not responsible for content of individual shows. The views expressed by show hosts or their guests are their own. Enjoy the show. I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's June 12th, and this is a kind of special podcast episode. And I guess it's special because I'm on vacation this week. After back-to-back weeks of MS conferences and multiple cross-country trips, and in preparation for an upcoming meeting of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee, I decided to take a week to stick my toes in the sand, listen to the waves, and just take a break. And there's probably a silly umbrella drink somewhere in that picture, too. But I wanted to leave you with something that I think matters a lot. We're all too familiar with how MS can profoundly affect your physical health, but it can also take a serious toll on your mental and emotional well-being. People living with MS often have to deal with depression, stress, anxiety, and these symptoms can become as debilitating as any others. Experts estimate that depression affects about 50% of the people diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and left unchecked. Depression can take your vibrant, colorful world and redraw it in somber shades of gray. So in a moment, I'm going to replay a really important conversation that I had last November with Dr. Amy Sullivan, Director of Behavioral Medicine Research and Training at the Mellon Center for Multiple Sclerosis at the Cleveland Clinic. If there's good news about depression, it's that it can be treated. And in our conversation... Dr. Sullivan shares some really important insights about living with MS and depression and what to do about it. My guest today is psychologist Dr. Amy Sullivan, Director of Behavioral Medicine Research and Training at the Mellon Center for Multiple Sclerosis at the Cleveland Clinic. And we're talking about MS and depression. So, Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Sullivan. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, I think it's a pretty important topic. I've read that upwards of 50% of the people diagnosed with MS will deal with depression at some point, and and that compares with only about 20% of the general population who will deal with depression in their lifetime. So what's the connection between MS and depression, what what makes it so much more likely that someone living with MS is going to also deal with depression? That's a great question. And and first I have to say, um, this is really important information that you're getting out there today. And so, um, you know, I really appreciate the fact that we're doing a, a podcast on this um, because it's just, this is one of the most undertreated symptoms of MS that, that I see. Um, so I want to start by just giving you a little bit of information. As you know, MS is a very unpredictable disease, and we see varying levels of disability and progression. And so I think that the unpredictable nature of this disease can really wreak havoc on one's mental health. So that would be one of the main reasons that we um, would see depression. And of course, there are other reasons. You know, some are pathophysiological. And then some can be related to um, some of the drugs that our MS patients take. And I know that, you know, when you talk about depression, it can be a little tricky. Anyone can have an off day. Anyone can have a bad day and you find yourself feeling sad. How does someone know whether they're feeling just sadness that's going to dissipate in in the next little bit or something more serious? Mm Mm-hmm. 
So when we think about depression, there are several signs or symptoms that one must be aware of. And like I said, one of the main symptoms of MS is depression. Um, So I think it's important that we kind of review some of the symptoms of depression. Certainly what you've described is sadness, um, kind of this this low-grade tearfulness or just being sad that you want to withdraw in my population, which is important to point out, is irritability. Um, My population, the MS population, seems to display irritability as one of their main um, signs of depression. We also see loss of energy, and of course, that can be um, part of the MS disease, but it can also be part of depression. So um, it certainly is necessary for somebody in behavioral medicine to evaluate some of these symptoms. Feelings of worthlessness or hopelessness, um, loss of interest in things that one um, used to enjoy, um, I- either increase in sleep or decrease in sleep, change in appetite or weight is another um, symptom of depression, decreased sex drive, another symptom of depression, and then thoughts of suicide. So what I'm looking for when I see my patients is, A, is this affecting their normal everyday life? So is this interfering with things that they um, do on a typical basis? Is it interfering with relationships that they have with important people in their life? Um, And is there a risk or thoughts of suicide? Um, In in these occasions, I think it's very important that somebody with uh, mental health expertise uh, be part of evaluating these patients. I think you raise a really important point, and I think that what happens sometimes is someone living with MS um, develops symptoms of depression, they recognize it, but because they haven't dealt with it before, they don't have a mental health expert as part of their care team yet. So what steps do they take? Should they call their neurologist? Should they call uh, their general practitioner? How do they connect with someone who can start the process of helping them out? Yeah, I think all of those are are great options. So I recognize that Mellon Center at the Cleveland Clinic has a a very special model, and we have a psychologist and a behavioral medicine team right here on staff. But I've talked to, I've gone around the country talking to different MS centers, and most of them don't have somebody tied to their center. And so I think it's important that we bring awareness to the neurology teams of, A, how um, likely it is what the high prevalence rates are for people um, with MS to develop a depression and anxiety disorder or any other mental health condition throughout their disease trajectory. And B, not only the prevalence, but what do you do? Um, And so I think um, when when our patients are meeting with their neurology teams, it's important to be honest with them, to say, you know, I'm noticing some change um, in my my emotional behaviors, thoughts, um, whatever they want to call it. And It's important for the neurologist to normalize that and say, yeah, this is a common complaint of people with MS. Um, It's also important, I think, for family members to partake in the MS patient's appointment. So um, if the the patient is um, not willing to verbalize these concerns, I think the family member needs to jump in and say, these are some of the things that I'm noticing and I'm I'm concerned for him or her and I um, I want to make sure that we address these issues. So they can do this in the neurology office, they can do this in the primary care office, um, in the OBGYN office. It doesn't matter where they do it, whoever they feel comfortable with, I just think it needs to be addressed and in, in, um, empowering our patients to um, recognize a, the, the signs and the symptoms um, as well as the high prevalence is, is going to be important and that's why I'm, I'm so thrilled that you're doing a po- podcast on this. Well, I'm really glad that you just brought up patients' families speaking up. I always say that MS affects families, not just individuals. And I'm wondering, how prevalent do you think depression is among MS caregivers? Wow, that's a great question. So the caregiver literature is newer in the MS world. Um, I don't know if we have prevalence data, but I would say that it's it's probably higher than the general population as well. Um, in my practice, we typically see, um, I, I see about, you know, one-fourth caregivers three-fourths individual MS patients. But I think when we think about the caregiver, we have to think about the whole family dynamic. So when one is diagnosed with this disease, 
this disease is usually a disease that hits when a patient is young, um, usually when their career is starting to take off, when they're developing family um, and friendships, when they're having children. And so this is a very pivotal time in, in one's life. And again, the unpredictability of this disease doesn't just impact the patient, it impacts the entire family dynamic. So when we think about the family as a whole, it's not just the significant other or the person who is, um, you know, playing the caregiving role if need be. It's the entire family. So it's the, the children are impacted. Um, the significant other is impacted. Maybe parents are impacted um, as well as the patient itself. But I think that you bring up a great point, which is that um, we need to make sure that the caregiver is taken care of just as we do the patient. We can get into a topic, of, you know, we can get into a whole other topic, which is caregiver burden, um, which is something that I'm very passionate about. But that that's a whole other topic, I think, that that should be addressed in, in making sure that um, the caregiver is taking care of themselves so that they can, in turn, take care of anyone around them. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You're talking to somebody who, who functioned for a long, long time as a caregiver. And uh, I, I understand a lot of the complexities of that role when it comes to the way I've always looked at it is the disposition of the caregiver really is going to impact the disposition of the person with MS, the person they're caring for. They're the ones who are going to bring their attitude, their outlook into the room, so to speak. And if they're yeah. having a rough time, that just creates more difficulty for everybody, I think. Yeah, so. I agree. What I see in that, in that um, role, too, is a lot of role reversal. So you find, um, so this, this can cause a lot of anxiety or a lot of um, disappointment or irritability, whatever the emotion um, is that, that one names. Because when you're looking at this population, you see, you know, a stay-at-home mom, let's say, having to transition into a work role or somebody who was the primary breadwinner now transitioning into the home role or a child who is having to transition into uh, being a caregiver or a nurse or um, some way of uh, taking care of, of their mother or father. And so when you see these role reversals, role reversals are, are things that um, people don't predict. They don't assume that this is going to happen to them. And so their life takes on a different path. Um, and they take on a role that wasn't something that was planned. And certainly that, that adjustment can cause um, significant emotional reaction. You know, when you discuss depression, a word that pops up often is resilience. But mm -hmm. an awful lot of what's been written about resilience tends to talk about it from the perspective of someone recovering from a specific traumatic event, maybe the loss of a loved one or some other significant life trauma. But MS isn't quite like that. Because it's unpredictable and because it's progressive, multiple sclerosis kind of presents you with chronic trauma as opposed to that one-off event that eventually does begin to shrink in the rearview mirror of life. So doesn't that make building resilience more challenging for people living with MS? Oh, absolutely. I think that that's a really important point. You know, when I think about resiliency, it, I think about my patients. So um, I've worked in some other populations, but I've been in the MS population now for the past uh, seven and a half years. And I will say this to anybody, my MS patients are by far the most resilient population that I have ever worked with. These are people who um, have faced and are facing some some adversity. They're facing significant uncertainty to uh, an incurable condition, um, but yet they come into the office and they want to work on how do you manage my emotional reaction um, and how do I make sure that MS that steals so much from me in so many other areas doesn't take my joy at the same time. Um, and so it's it's so important for me to to see the work of my patients because I gain resilience from them. I feel like if if we all just took a sampling of, of all of the MS patients that we knew and looked at what they go through on a daily basis, I think to myself, wow, I am going to try to mirror one of the skills that I know one of my patients is um, per, is practicing on a daily basis. So I think you're so right. It's it's um, it's such a this is such a resilient population um, that I'm thrilled to to have a part in in touching their lives. 
what are some of the steps that you might recommend to someone listening to this who, who wants to work on developing uh, a higher level of resilience? Uh, what can they do yeah. to build resilience? Oh, I think there's a lot of steps. It, you know, one one thing is it's it's not a one size fits all model, and so I think e- evaluating somebody and helping them come up with their own personal individualized treatment plan is always an important thing. Um, but I think it's also important to be flexible. So knowing that you know this is not the life that I chose, but this is the life that I have, and so how do I make the most out of the situation that's in front of me? And that's that's a really important. Um, that's a really important task that we can practice in therapy. Um, one of the most important things I think is is to develop if you don't have it, but if you relationships, but if you do have relationships, to make sure that you're building them. And so we think about this not only for the patient, but as you mentioned earlier, the caregiver, developing relationships outside of just. Um, your family dynamic, I think, is so important. Relationships make us who we are. They help us to develop our value system. Um, I think relationship building is is one of the, the most important steps that one can take. Um, I think another role that's important, again, not only for the MS patient but the caregiver, is taking good care of yourself, both mentally, physically, and spiritually, if one has a spiritual um approach that they like to take. So oftentimes we see uh, caregivers and even our patients, even ourselves, myself in a caregiving role as a as a clinician, I oftentimes put everybody else in front of me um, and I and I don't take time to take care of myself. And when I do that, I find that I'm not as good as a, of, of a caregiver to my own patients or to my own family at home, um, very similar to how um, my patients are. We have to learn how to, as the you know the um, airline stewardess analogy. I think she says it's the best when you're you're getting on a flight and she's going over the emergency procedures and she says in the event of an emergency, um, if the cabin loses pressure and the oxygen mask drop, it's important to put on our oxygen mask first before you put on the oxygen mask of of anyone around you. And basically that says making sure that we take care of ourselves before we take care of anyone else around us. Well. I, I can't thank you enough for taking time today to talk with us. I mean, I, I, I totally agree that this is such an important subject. Uh, as you said, it, it, it's so often undertreated. And, and beyond that, it, I think that if people don't get a handle on it, it can really color someone's quality of life uh, yeah. in, in, in a pretty dramatic way. So I think it's a subject we're going to be coming back to um, yeah. because it is so important. So I want to thank you again for all that you do to raise awareness, let people know that they can take these steps to build resilience and manage depression rather than simply allow it to take over their life and become a victim of it. Uh, I, I really hope we have a chance to connect again. Oh, thank you so much. And I I just want to leave with a couple of things. And one is, you know, making sure that we normalize these issues. These are things that we need to make sure that people are aware of and not stigmatize it. The other is, like I said earlier, in in this disease that I treat and that many people live, MS takes so much from an individual. Don't let it steal your joy. And, you know, I think finally, you know, do the research, you know, Twitter is a great place to um, get some research. Your podcast is a great place to get some research. But let's make sure that we're talking about depression and anxiety and the mental health issues as well as the physical symptoms. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, Dr. Amy Sullivan, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, that's going to wrap up this special vacation edition of Real Talk MS. I'll be back next week with a brand new episode. My name is John Strum. Thanks for listening. And we'll catch you next time.